You have watched Brewster's Millions. I did. I did indeed watch Brewster's Million. It is a Richard Pryor comedy that also co-stars John Candy. It's not very funny. And the stuff that tried to be funny just wasn't. They tell me you are my only living relative. You have 30 days in which to spend 30 million bucks. He inherited it. If you can do it, you get 300 million. But if you fail, you don't get Deadly. Why can't I tell my friends? Because I don't want anybody to help me out. I think we should consider the possibility of psychiatric help. He can't keep it unless he can spend it and have nothing left but the shirt on his back. Everybody, anybody want to go to lunch? Brewster's Millions. Eric. Yes, Tig. You have watched Brewster's Millions. I did. I did indeed watch Brewster's Millions. It is a Richard Pryor comedy that also co-stars John Candy, two of the funniest people of the 1980s. It's an entertaining movie, and I enjoyed it. It's not very funny, and the stuff that tried to be funny just wasn't. There's some decent actors in that supporting cast. You know, the, the dad from Seventh Heaven. Thank you, I will. Hume Cronin. He plays the one that he inherits the money from. I never had any friends. Jerry Orbach, you know, Mr. Law and Order. Watch the goddamn ball, Johnson! You're not a farmer! You don't have to swing and shit in the dirt! But then there were others like the, the woman that, that Richard Pryor is infatuated with. Uh, uh, Angela yeah. Drake, uh, Lynette McKee, I think her name is. The, the movie never indicated to me why Brewster was so infatuated with her. It was just, he just was sort of like instantly in love with her. In the beginning of the movie, he, he's like a hound. He's flirting with the, the girl in the stands who's the guy at Bat's girlfriend. Yes. And then, and then he strikes him out and then they're at the bar and, and he's hitting on her with John Candy. Like they're, so I guess it was supposed to be interpreted that he's sort of a hound. And then he's infatuated with her because she's like the smart businesswoman, you know. Right. I went to Loyola. Loyola, Chicago. Chicago. I know the city and I know the college. The movie is based on a, no a 1902 novel of the same name. Seven other movies were made about this novel. I didn't know that either. Monty Brewster is a uh, minor league baseball player who suddenly inherits $300 million from an unknown dead relative. But there's a catch to it. He can either take a million dollars and just walk away, or he has to spend $30 million in 30 days in order to inherit the $300 million. <laughs> I'm going to go for the 300 million. But of course, there's all sorts of catches with how he can spend it. Right, like, he can't give it away. He can't donate it all. He can't have any assets, so he can't buy a house or buy expensive things that are worth something at the end of it. Yeah, he has to be completely broke at the end of that 30 days. Right. When you appear before us again in 30 days, Mr. Brewster, you must be totally penniless, without assets of any kind, having nothing but the receipt for your expenses and the clothes on your back. Are you certain you want to do this, Mr. Brewster? No, sir, I'm not certain. But I'm going to have a lot of fun finding out. And he can't tell anybody he's doing it. So therefore, everybody thinks he's crazy or he's a jerk or he's waste, you know, he's wasting his money. It causes all these problems for him. And like I said, he also realizes it's not very easy to spend that much money. Let me touch on the stuff that I liked. It was mostly charming throughout. And I thought Richard Pryor, even though he wasn't particularly funny in it at all, and he completely lacked the Richard Pryor edge that Pryor had, he did a good job of playing sort of a, a hapless schmuck. He actually did most of the heavy lifting because John Candy was sort of mailing it in. This is probably one of the only movies where he's in that I can think of where he he didn't need to almost be there. You know, his sort of role in the movie is to be the 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 guy who's disappointed in the way Brewster is is acting. I make the guy ten million dollars and he acts like it's a funeral. He's the party guy, but also the audience surrogate. He doesn't really do anything. John Candy was such a lovable, lovable actor. Like, everybody loves John Candy. Right. It was kind of a little disappointing that he didn't have a, a, a better role in it. I did like that it sort of touched on the idea of how money could seemingly change someone or corrupt someone, even though in his case, it wasn't actually doing that. And he's actually blowing through the, the money on, like, some legitimate things that, like, wealthy people do, like, you know, spending obscene amounts of money to redecorate, you know, your hotel suite in ugly ways and- Well, Monty, what do you think of our postmodern fantasy? 
and buy an iceberg. Yeah, 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 exactly. I'd like to call your attention to this area right here. This is the Arabian Desert. It is as dry as a bone. It's a place where a glass of ice water can cost you as much as $5 a glass, sir. What I would like to do is go to the North Pole, select a good size iceberg, and simply dig out a chamber from the rear end of it, drop in two 20,000 horsepower marine diesel engines, and sail, ah, Roostersburg, number one, to Mecca. What do you think, sir? The way it engaged me most, as I'm watching the movie, I'm thinking through his dilemma and trying to figure out like, okay, so how, how do you do this successfully? I do feel like the movie played a little fast and loose with the rules that he had to um, abide by, right? He's routinely throwing parties and taking hundreds of people out to dinner and all that. Isn't that charity? If he's going to pay the security guards or the and and the people, I'm, I'll pay you four thousand dollars a week or whatever. I'll pay you two thousand dollars a week to be the chief of my security. No, 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 no. Like, who determines how much you can pay them? Jake, I'd like to hire you as my official photographer. Salary ten thousand dollars a week. Ten thousand dollars a week. This guy's a jerk. Money. <laughs> Shut up. I accept. <laughs> Like, right. They yeah. don't say that. So say you're going to pay him a million dollars a week. Like, how did you determine what it costs to, and like you said, taking all these people out to eat, well, then technically he could take all of New York City out to eat. Anybody want to go to lunch? I'll, I'm buying. Yeah! It's a fun puzzle. It's fun to like yeah. to try and think your way through doing that. I'll get to my <laughs> solutions in a, in a moment. I did do some calculations. With inflation, the amount that he had to spend would be just over seventy-two million in today's dollar. That was one of the other things with the uh, the the scene with the stamp. These stamps originally printed. This is the only known copy in existence. They think, oh ho, we bought this, and he can't destroy it, so he screwed, and he uses it to mail a postcard to the guys that are trying to stop him from getting the money. <laughs> God, it isn't an asset anymore. He's mailed it. Yeah, which I thought I thought that was really fun and really yeah. clever. Though I also kind of feel like that kind of breaks the rules too, because if you're 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 buying this extremely expensive stamp, isn't using it affect like that's destroying? But whatever, it was a fun it's, it was a fun scene for the movie. Like it's one of those it's one of the movies where at the end of the day, you know, it didn't end there. There'd be countless lawsuits for going on for years on whether he like broke any <laughs> rules and all. Yeah. That. Speaking of, of of the ending, boy, the ending is abrupt as hell. Literally, the the credits roll like literally about three seconds after he gets the money. He's like, oh, oh, go, and we get the last minute thing, and yay! Oh my god, I got the money! I well, oh, wow, I three hundred million. That's great. Credits roll. <laughs> <laughs> like the idea that a mere month this guy completely takes over all the media like all the newspapers yeah, yeah, he's instantly he's, who the hell is that Bonnie Bruce the richest guy in the world and I work for him he's front page news like every other day he he mounts an entire campaign for mayor in in a matter of just a couple of weeks and like somehow captivates the entire city the idea that like all this could be could unfold so rapidly was, was 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 kind of absurd. I, I remember being a kid and like I wanted a shirt that said vote none of the above yeah. forever after this movie. Let me hear it one more time! I think one of the m most redeeming things uh, of the picture for me, his real goal, the one thing that he wanted to do more than anything else with this money that, that, that he had come into was I want to play against the Yankees. Yeah, I, that's, his, that's I, what the whole thing is about. Charlie, I am going to get the team new uniform. And I'm going to arrange it so that we can play the New York Yankees. His whole thing is still, I'm a ball player. I want to be a ball player. My dream is to, is to square off against the Yankees. And I want to bring my teammates with me. And I want us all to have this experience. And, and I loved that. I thought that was, that was terrific. And, and more than anything, that kind of got to the heart of who the Brewster character was. Yeah, he was trying to win the big money, but not out of greed, really. It was more of a challenge for him, and he realized that he could use that to fulfill dreams that were important to him. And his dreams weren't dreams of guilt. They were dreams of, like, he wanted to be a ball player. That's what it was all about. He's basically a washed-up minor league baseball player. He realizes that this could be a chance for him to play against the Yankees, like live his dream, even if he has to pay for it. Yeah, and that sold me on him as a character. And I really kind of related to that idea because when I daydream of lottery wins, I don't daydream, daydream about um, extravagant parties yeah, and, and cars and, and a yacht. I daydream about having a music studio in my home and just recording music all day and did you even notice he broke the fourth wall for one moment? Yes, I did. Yes, yeah, he, he, he closes the door after- Warren well, leaves. Now that was a real asshole. 
I thought the 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 actual comedic aspects were were really low key. It was you know it, it wasn't funny, but it was fun. The director was Walter Hill. I'm kind of curious if this is maybe why he directed The Warriors. He said that every movie he ever made, he wanted to be a western. Oh really? So, and he hated making these eighty mo these movies because he always wanted to do westerns. So he always tried to make his movies westerns, even if they weren't westerns. I mean, what, you you have two powerhouses like Richard Pryor and John Candy, and like we were talking about before. Unfortunately, John Candy doesn't really have much to do here. Yeah, um, yeah. He's only funny in that. Oh, look! It's like the the the, the big the big guy who's a party animal, zany kind of kind of way. There you go, sir. I'm waiting. Allow me. Thank you very much. I wish that there would have been more interaction between him and John Candy because the the John Candy's character, like his sort of role there as as the best friend who is both riding Brewster's coattails, but also concerned about. Yeah. I wish the movie would have leaned into that a little more. Want to find a job for you yet, by the way? Like designated eater? <laughs> I don't want a job. I'm his friend. What's that pay? And either ditched or or handled differently the, the whole sort of love, the unrequited love aspect of it. Because honestly, like that part wasn't handled. Yeah, that part well. I always uh, blanked out almost. It's almost like filler. And I get that it makes tension between her and her fiancé who ends up working for the firm that's trying to stop him from getting the money and he's trying to screw him over by holding on to the money. I get it, like, you know, connects all that. But like you said, it could have been handled maybe differently or the way that she, the way her character goes about it is kind of annoying because she's real uptight. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. She was like overly uptight. Mm. I would be ashamed to introduce my family to somebody like you. Just forget it, okay? And I hope you have fun at that party because that's all you got left. You'll never know, Mr. Booster. Be sure to get home before the sun comes up, you know what I mean? I'm gonna go warm up, Mr. Why don't you try to sing? She was overly uptight and didn't need to be, because because really all you, all you need to get across is the idea that, like, the people who are around Monty Brewster are concerned about the way he's handling this this money, and they think he's, he's flying off the rails. That kind of stuff I easily could have had ejected from the movie because the other stuff was he he invests in the idiotic iceberg idea and ends up making tons tons of money on it um you know he places all these bets and he wins tons of money on you know that all that stuff was a lot of fun like i was saying before it gets into like this sort of puzzle box idea of what he has to accomplish to me that was the, the most interesting thing was like how is he gonna do it right how is he gonna how is he gonna accomplish this Everything, everything that concerned that, I really enjoyed that. Once Warren is in cahoots with trying to screw him over, he like gets that extra twenty thousand dollars. He says he needs like a down payment to get the furniture to redecorate. That also bothered me because from that point on, it doesn't matter what he does. It was set up too, way too obviously. They underline it big time because when he goes to get the twenty thousand, there's even that shot of as he's exiting the door of like him looking, you know. If they didn't sell that, it would have been better because at the end you would have been like, oh, I did forgot. You forgot that they did that he didn't have a receipt for that or whatever. Yeah, you're exactly right. You knew what the ending was 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 going to be. Yeah. You knew he was going to be in that office, and th th there was going to be like the surprise gotcha and then they was gonna have to figure out how to get you know get out of it you're a liar one you tricked me set me up oh no no not at all no, that was just a coincidence did you enjoy rick moranis's role oh i'm glad you brought that up yeah i i, I should have jotted that down as a note yeah oh like that that for like 13 seconds that he's in it terrific it's he amazing right all right let's get some fun around here what what who the hell are you who the hell are you who the hell am I? I'm Morty King, King of the Mimics, that's who. Anything you say, I guarantee it'll be repeated. Yes, it sounds yes. It's a knockout. It's a knockout. We're going to knock out the walls, too. Everyone. Everyone. Everywhere. Everywhere. Spare no expense. Spare no expense. Will you shut up? Will you shut up? I get, get four sets. Get four sets. Get four sets. Wonderful. I'd love to do your pretty You know, I'd like you to do it. I like that. Choke this guy. Choke this guy. Come on. I thought it was good fun. I'm definitely glad that I I watched it. All the stuff having to do with Brewster's Dilemma and having to figure out how he's going to accomplish what he's going to accomplish. I really enjoyed that a lot um, because I enjoyed like trying to think through it myself. Yeah. And I, I, I really liked Richard Pryor's take on the character. I thought, I thought he actually brought some heart to it. I said before, I was going to mention how I would have solved the, the, the oh, dilemma yes. of, 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 of doing that. Curious. You just hire world famous bands to, you know, book private concerts for yourself for, for a month straight. That's actually, that's actually true, right? Cause you, you're it, not, you're not getting anything in return. Like that's a value. I'm glad that you, I'm glad you watched it. 
Yeah, it's good. It actually, it made me want to check out some, uh, like, it made me want to watch the toy. I guess we don't know what our next ones will be yet. We're, we are determining that. So people will just have to stay tuned and, and see what's uh, what's coming next for uh, the movie club. In the meantime, maybe you can like this video and subscribe to our channel. Maybe check out our Patreon at Nerd Out With Me. Wicked smart, you Wicked say. smart. I've been, I've, I've been Eric. And I was Tig. Bye. Bye-bye.